you can all hear me. You certainly can see me. I have to apologize that I, don't, um, I didn't have any slides. And as a consequence, I didn't, don't have one of those close-up cameras. So you, I won't be able to show you the inside of my mouth or, or anything like that. But what I do want to talk to you about was about the British Empire and its legacy in global governance. And I wanted to speak very much uh, uh, as a writer and someone who went through an experience um, with my book, uh, which was published last year uh, in hardback and is now available in paperback at a good store near you. <laughs> my origins, my family origins, are obviously uh, in West Africa. Anyone who's seen my name or knows anything about Ghana will know immediately that my name is, is from Ghana. In fact, a friend of mine says uh, that this is Mr. Kwatang, Ghanaian for Smith. It's not quite, it's not quite right, but uh, it's a common name in Ghana, and uh, that's where my family are from. And so I always had, uh, growing up in London, coming from a Ghanaian family, I always had an interest in uh, modern Britain, and particularly modern, Britain, modern Britain's relationship with the British Empire. That was something that was always uh, at the back of my mind, something I was always engaged with. Uh, and um, I was particularly interested um, at the time, I mean, my, my, my interest was crystallized uh, at the time of the Iraq War, uh, 10 years ago, or nine years ago. I'm 37 years old, and I think it was Napoleon who always said that if you want to look at a politician's uh, mindset, if you want to look at anyone in public life, you've got to look at the, the time when they were between 20 and 30, because that's largely when uh, a certain type of consciousness, certain views, if you like, uh, crystallize and harden. And I think the most significant um, episode of my 20s, and for people of my generation, was uh, obviously 9-11, and the response to 9-11, uh, by the United States. And it was evident at the time, even though the election had been very close between Gore and Bush, that the Bush team had a very particular view of America's uh, position in the world. And that necessarily informed their reaction to this very significant event, which was 9-11. And what was significant about that was that, I mean, it was dubbed the neoconservative line, and it was very much a, a view that saw American values, democracy, free trade, uh, capitalism generally, not just as good things, but as a, a system which could be exported and which other countries could essentially be forced to adopt. Because it, the view was that if uh, these things were goods, they would be appreciated by other people. And Bush very famously said in one State of the Union address that these rights and he was echoing the language in the um, document regarding the, the independence, the uh, Declaration of Independence. These rights were God-given. They weren't uh, rights which necessarily had been uh, dreamt up by the American people or by the Western Enlightenment. And in the context of empire, uh, with, with regard to 2003, what stimulated my mind and stimulated my thinking was the publication of a book uh, by Neil Ferguson, which was called Empire. Um, and in that book, he articulated a neoconservative philosophy of the British Empire. And it was really the first time that someone had done this in this revisionist way, because uh, in the past, certainly when I was at university, the view that was dominant about empire was uh, a Marxist view, uh, broadly, that uh, empire was all about economics and was all about exploiting other countries uh, for the good of the imperial power. Now, Neil Ferguson's book, Empire, was suggesting that empire was actually a good thing for the, the countries that were ruled. They had uh, the rule of law, they had uh, democracy, uh, they even had afternoon tea and cricket, if that's what they wanted to do, and uh, that it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was generally regarded as a good thing. Now, in the middle of 2003, I was working in London in a, in a bank, and Hundreds of thousands of people my age, younger people, were out on the streets uh, marching against the war. And it seemed to me that that was a good uh, start, a good uh, place to begin thinking about empire. I felt at the time that we didn't know enough to commit our troops to war, but once they were committed, I was supportive of the government, the government's line. I was always very skeptical, however, of the neoconservative argument. I always felt that that was a case of special pleading 
and didn't really, uh, uh, didn't really work. It wasn't something that necessarily uh, was going to work simply because there was uncertainty. We didn't know enough about the outcomes. We didn't know enough, as it turned out, about Iraq and about what the reaction to uh, an invasion would be. And so I was, again, working, thinking about writing a book and my, about the empire, because that tied up my historical interests and what was going on around me. And I instinctively felt that this neoconservative line, this revisionist line, uh, didn't work. I was also um, very profoundly unconvinced about Marxist history for all sorts of reasons. I mean, the principal reason is um, because I, I don't believe in historical determinism. I don't think things are inevitable. Um, and in fact, if you think about it, if you really believe that, you probably would not engage in the, in the democratic pro process where people are electing uh, politicians and, and hoping to see, to affect outcomes. If you thought that democracy or choices didn't affect outcomes, logically, I don't think you would, you would, you would engage uh, with politics and you would believe that there were great tides of history that were sweeping uh, mankind towards a goal. So I started um, research probably in about 2007 uh, on, on, on the, the theme of the British Empire. And what I found was that it was entirely uh, an idiosyncratic affair. It was something that was incredibly unsystematic. And what I was particularly amazed at was the range of characters that people that populated this story. I mean, very, very bizarre people that if you met in the street, you would probably run away from. Um, and yet they were invested with huge powers to determine the fate of, of, of millions of people around the world. I mean, there were people like Percy Cox, who was a very hard-bitten soldier, and he was supposed to be a great linguist, but someone said of him that he could keep silence perfectly in a dozen languages, um, which was an odd thing, really, to say about a great linguist. There were other people like General Gordon, who was entirely driven by the fact that he felt that the Garden of Eden was on the Seychelles. That was a, a, a powerful um, conviction that he had. And he spent... Uh, many years actually trying to locate uh, the, the Garden of Eden and, and very foolishly, I don't think he ever went there. He thought that he could, you know, by reading and by um, di divination, he could work out where this thing was. And what my conclusion was in terms of the, 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 the vast range of individual characters and the vast range of um, countries that they, they ruled was that the, the, the real secret was that there was no secret. And, the, and there were a couple of reasons for that. The first reason was simply because uh, there were very few resources at, at home, especially after the First World War and most particularly after the Second World War. There wasn't the resource really to do the homework, to find out enough about the regions that were being governed. Um, and there was a great belief in individual responsibility. Now I want to say a few words about that. Today we live in a world uh, in a Britain and a, and, a, and a Western world, which is much more collectivized. We think much more in terms of groups, uh, the, the, just in, pure, in terms of pure economics. The state um, spends vastly more resources as a proportion of uh, the total economy uh, than it did in the, before the First World War. I mean, that's a fact. Before the First World War, people talked about the night watchman state. It was a very minimal state. And what couple, was coupled with that was a notion of individuality that we would find um, quite alarming in many ways. Uh, there was a great set, and, and this ties in as well with a lot of the social Darwinism of the period. Um, there was a great feeling that if you let people, the best people, um, go off and run things, you would get the best outcomes without regard to their, their training, to their, um, their, their, their character, if you like, uh, as, as fit rulers. It was very much an elitist uh, operation. So how you joined the elite was you got a good education, probably at a, at a private school. You went to Oxford or Cambridge or the army. Those were the three ways uh, to get on. And once you'd gone through that, it was generally believed that you could go off and run uh, Patagonia or, 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 or run um, other countries, Australia or India or wherever it might be. Um, and the feeling behind that was that um, this, these are the best people and they will make the best decisions. So you had this world in which um, someone said, you know, a man with a first in classics from Oxford could turn his hand to anything. Um, and it was, it was partly true, but there were also some disastrous uh, consequences to that. 
And as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a corollary of this uh, individualism, which I describe as anarchic individualism, there was a chronic instability uh, within the empire itself. And I'll explain what I mean by this. If the assumption is that one individual can take decisions and really direct policy in a way in which the center is not fully engaged with, the corollary of that is that that particular individual might be replaced by another person who had a completely different set of ideas and set of goals. And it was never the case that someone was summoned in and told, you're now going off to Nigeria. This is the plan. That never happened. They were told you were going to Nigeria, and essentially they, they made up the plan uh, once they were already there. And in a number of instances, you could see the, the, the disastrous consequences of this. Uh, one incident I look at is Sudan. In the Sudan, we have the newest country in the world, the Republic of South Sudan. Now, that was a consequence of a 50-year on-and-off uh, civil war, which was a direct consequence of imperial policy. In 1930, a man called Harold McMichael, he was called Horrible Harold, as I suppose you would be if you weren't very popular and called Harold. Um, he was called Horrible Harold, and he essentially decided to, to, to siphon off, to cut off the north of Sudan from the south of Sudan on the grounds that the north of Sudan was Arabic-speaking, it was Islamic, and had a very different culture from the south of Sudan, where, um, in their language, there were African peoples, uh, they, had, they followed animistic religions and Christianity, um, and they were different. So they were ruled differently. Now, this policy worked all very well for about 16 years, but was reversed by a man called uh, James Robertson. And it was reversed in 1946. So what happened at that point was that for 16 years, the south of Sudan had had an entirely different path of development. They weren't taught Arabic. They weren't taught about Islam. And yet, in 1946, they were put together, and the country was declared independent uh, only nine years later. And even in 1946, when the civil, servants, uh, civil service was formed, there were 800 civil servants uh, what they called native civil servants, actual Sudanese. But only about half a dozen of them were from the South Sudan because the civil service was run in Arabic and uh, followed very much an Islamic uh, Sharia law and Islamic political structures. So this country was entirely artificial and was, and was yoked together. Um, and as a consequence of that, the, even before independence was declared in 1956, there was the Torrid Mutiny, where the South, of, where the South Sudan um, essentially uh, was fighting for its own independence. This is, an, in a nutshell, is what happened in Sudan. And what I looked at, and what I was particularly interested in, was the way in which these individuals' decisions would affect uh, outcomes that we have to live with today. The other example of this, a smaller example, was in Hong Kong, where essentially, after the Second World War, uh, Brian Young, the governor, thought it would be a good idea to introduce a measure of democracy uh, into Hong Kong. And he brought about municipal elections. What happened was that he left, and uh, another gentleman called Alexander Grantham uh, was, was, was put, made in charge, was made the governor. And essentially, he canceled uh, Young's attempts to introduce a, a modicum of democracy. And he said in his memoirs that, as governor, I was treated as almighty God. That was how he felt. I mean, he, he loved the idea when he walked into a room, everyone stood up, and there were sort of form, formal courtesies that were extended to him, which were quite extraordinary. They were quite um, different to what actually had happened in, in the mother country, in England. England was evolving at a much faster rate uh, than the empire. And these tin pot gods essentially were managed, uh, managed to pursue this, this line of policy. And I argued in my book that Hong Kong, um, if it had gone down a, the, the democratic route, um, it wasn't something that would have happened immediately. It was something that might have evolved. But I think there would have been a much, uh, a totally different outcome, perhaps, speci specifically with our relation to China. And what was so damaging and confusing to the Chinese was that uh, at the time when Chris Patton came in, we had ruled Hong Kong for 150 years. And even though he made a huge uh, song and dance about democracy, the Chinese and the British officials felt that we had made no attempt uh, to introduce democracy 
uh, into Hong Kong over a 145-year period. It was only really at the end, not even the 11th hour. I mean, as a proportion, it was sort of 11.50 of the time that we were there. It was only really at the end that an attempt to, uh, to, to make uh, democratic progress uh, was made. Um, in short, my research led me to believe that uh, neoconservatism was not a viable way uh, of global governance and that the British Empire really should be understood in its own terms and uh, a determinist account, a Marxist account and the neoconservative account, uh, in my view, fell gravely short of, of an adequate description of what the British Empire was all about. Thank you.